Uh, good to see you guys. Amen. Um, praise God. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, so, uh, uh, going through some more of the churches. Um, we're not going to get through all seven churches in two weeks. I guess you guys know that, right? Um, but we'll get through a couple more churches today. Uh, I'm not going to do one church for sure, just because for the sake of time. Uh, so I'll do two today, and then whenever the next time I'm up, I'll pick back up where we left off. Um, but we'll make our way through these, and then whenever time comes up, we'll keep on going through the book. Amen? Uh, what I do want to do, tell you guys right now, um, if you have questions, topics out of the book of Revelation that you want me specifically to talk about, what I would like for you to do is tell me what they are. Tell me after service today, write them down. If you could write me a little note and give it to me. And then I'll, I'll you know, see if the Lord lets me work that into uh, what we're going to talk about. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So, Father, we just want to give you thanks and praise. We want to worship you, Lord. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, we give you thanks for all that you have done for us, uh, all that we have been able to see. Uh, you've, been, you've, you've shown us your power. You've shown us your glory. You've shown us your love. And uh, we just want to thank you that, uh, for that, Lord, that you've allowed us to be partakers of your love and partakers of your passion uh, to see us a part of your kingdom, to see us as a part of your family. And uh, we say thank you for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. Uh, we give you praise as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. All things that exist, they exist because of you. And, uh, and so we acknowledge you as the creator of all things. And uh, we thank you, Father, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us, to redeem, for redeeming us, uh, to redeem us from sickness and from sin and from disease and from death and you've redeemed us and made us part of your family and we now have everlasting life. Uh, life on this earth uh, uh, abundant and life eternally forever even more abundant. And so we thank you and we bless you for that Lord. Uh, Holy Spirit we welcome you into this room uh, tonight. We ask that you be with us, that you uh, walk up and down in this place and commune with us and fellowship with us and that you would teach us and instruct us, God, that you will open our eyes to see and our ears to hear so that we can understand your word. And uh, so we just thank you for the outpouring. We thank you for the outpouring. We thank you for the outpouring. We thank you for the anointing. We thank you, Lord, for the anointing. We thank you for revelation, Lord. We thank you for opening our eyes in the name of Jesus. We thank you for revelation, Lord. We thank you for making things clear. Hallelujah. We do bless your name, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, so just want to recap, this is going to be real quick because uh, I've got a lot of ground I would like to cover. Um, so last week we started the concept of the book of Revelation and we started by some of the overviews. I'm just going to point these out right now. Uh, if you remember, we talked about last week, John, this was a revelation, a series of revelations, visions and, and words that he heard from the Lord while he was banished on the Isle of... Patmos, that's right. <laughs> uh, remember, I told you guys, nobody caught this last week, so let me lay this out there. I remember I mentioned last week uh, that John and Jesus' mother Mary had moved there uh, to Ephesus. That's, that's what history kind of records. And it was while he was there preaching the gospel that they uh, exiled him to the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. Um, nobody caught why was Jesus, or excuse me, why was Mary with John in Ephesus? Yes, exactly. Jesus had instructed John, hey, take care of, this is now your mother. In other words, when he was on the cross dying and, uh, and told his mother, behold your son. 
And so he took care of him. And the evidence is, is that when he went to the Isle of, or excuse me, to Ephesus and moved over in that area, that she went with him. Amen. So, yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, he went there and preached the gospel. Uh, we talked about, I do want to turn to this, open up your Bible to, to Revelation chapter one. Um, verse three. Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is he that reads and he that hears the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. So blessed are those who read. All right, got to read it. And then where it says hear and those that hear the word, the word actually means, uh, it does mean to hear, but then it also means to understand and to comprehend. So when you read it, beyond reading it, we need to understand what's in the book. Amen? Um, and then it says to keep the things that are therein. And like I said last week, uh, a lot of times the book is, this book is glossed over. The book of Revelation is glossed over. Many people uh, do not read that book. They just skip right on over it. Um, <clears throat> but the Bible says blessed is the man who reads it, who understands it, and keeps the things in there. So we ought not be skipping over it. Amen. Um, I told you that the book of Revelation was laid out in, I'm saying two main, it was two, it's, it's three categories, but it's two main categories. So the first one is, uh, he told him to write the things that you see. So that one's real brief because it was really only chapter one. Then he said, write the things that are and the things that shall be hereafter. So those are the two main components, the things that are. And then the things that are hereafter. And when it said the things that are, those things are covered in chapter 2 uh, until chapter 5. Amen. Uh, and then after that is the things that shall be. Um, and then uh, we went on to talk about uh, the first book, the first letter that was written, which was written to Ephesus. Uh, and I gave you some key points before we got going, and I want to give them again. Uh, these letters were written to each letter was written specifically to a church, all right? Um, <clears> or <throat> well, I'm saying that, but they were all together in one letter. But he addressed each church individually. And each letter has something different because each church was different, amen? Um, so they were written to specific churches. Um, and then I pointed out how at the end of every letter, he says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So even though this is written to a specific church, our ears should be perked up to hear because through the spirit, he's also speaking to churches throughout time. Amen. Amen. Um, I've talked about how um, of the seven churches, five of them got had varying degrees of uh, faults that the Lord found with them. And, and some of them were similar. and Some of them were different. Uh, and then I talked about that there are two churches that, out of that seven that the Lord did not have any complaints about. So that's just an overview of those letters. Five, they had complaints. Two, they were in good shape. Um, and then, but then, and then I told you how there was one church, which was Ephesus last week, only had really one complaint. Um, there's another church that the Lord had nothing good to say to them. Everything about them was bad, and he needed them to get themselves together. Amen. So, but in spite of, you know, some people might say, well, Ephesus, you know, they only had one problem. So I can see them still being in good shape. But look, even the, the church that had nothing good, the Lord still called them his church. And he still gave them space to repent. He wrote to them to tell, to give them instruction on what they needed to do to fix what was wrong. Amen. And then he gave them space to repent. Um, and then, but how, so God is great in mercy. He is rich in mercies. Amen. Praise God for that. But at the same time, he does draw the line. Amen. And he's telling them, fix this or else. So uh, he does draw the line. So he is long and rich in mercies. Amen. But there is a limit. All right. So um, now there are two main things that I want us to be looking at as we go through these. Uh, one thing is, is that all of these letters uh, that were written can identify 
with every church out here, I believe it can identify with just about every church that's in the earth. Somewhere, every one of, every one of us, the churches can find themselves in there. So that means that we need to be listening for God and, and seeing if he's giving us instruction through e e any of those letters. Amen. Which church do we identify with? Uh, and, you know, I do want to say this because I didn't say it last week. You know, Pastor Cox set this out a couple decades ago that uh, our striving is to be like the Church of Philadelphia, uh, uh, one of the churches that had no complaints. Amen. Um, but then also churches is make churches are made up of who? People. So if the churches are made up of people and churches can be in error, that means we can be in error. So in reality, we can even be reading these letters to see how they apply to our everyday life. Amen. We can find ourselves in these letters somewhere. So when we study these, when you read them on your own, uh, we need to be listening with that ear. OK, God, where am I in this? What are you saying to me? Does this apply to me? That's what we should be doing. Amen. All right. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at the next uh, letter that we're going to do, which is going to be the letter to Smyrna. So turn over to chapter 2. So as I did last week, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, <clears throat> some of the history, this is general history, like I told you last week. This isn't all biblical history. You know, the Bible is a history book, but then there are other books that are history books, too, so we can learn something. So I looked up the history of Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna was known as a very beautiful city and a very wealthy city. It was a port city. So they were very wealthy, and it was beautiful. The, the writings, uh, the, the, the stuff that I researched said that the architecture in particular was very beautiful there. So it was a very beautiful city, um, and they were quite wealthy. Uh, however... They built, uh, part of the uh, 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 architecture was they built a lot of temples. And they built temples to their, you know, these are in the Grecian, these, these are Greek cities, amen? Now, by the time the Bible came along, Rome had kind of conquered, but they still had Greek in them. That was what they were. And so they worshiped all these Greek gods, right? So Smyrna, they built temples to Zeus. I can't pronounce this Sybil. I'm going to say Sybil, uh, Aphrodite, and Dion, uh, Dionysus, uh, Dion, Dionysius, excuse me. They, wrote, they built temples to these gods. Now, here's what's crazy. One city got temples of worship to all these different gods. You're talking about lost and confused? <laughs> At least in Ephesus, they just worshiped Diana, the great Diana, right? Smyrna? They had temples built to all kind of gods. That's kind of batty. But that's how deep they were in this thing. They were all about uh, what I'm going to call is, is idol worship and superstition and stuff like that. Um, now, in addition to all these Greek gods that they built these temples to, they also built temples uh, and dedicated them to some of the Roman kings, uh, emperors that came along. They built temples to and dedicated them to them. Back then, they would do. They worshipped some of the emperors in in uh, Rome. So, you got one little city worshiping four or five different Greek gods, and they got other temples worshiping emperors, plain old men. Right? You see how how entrenched this was in their city. This is what they were about. Let's see, they had to be all just plain old confused. Uh, that's, that's nuts to me. Um, so, uh, and then, and then uh, last thing, one, so one, I told you they dedicated the temple to some of the uh, emperors. Well, Smyrna had put a bid in. They wanted to build the temple to one of the Roman uh, 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 emperors. And so they wanted to bid. And so they built this temple. Uh, with the approval of Rome to this emperor. And they had been, they, then at that point, they were charged with taking care of the temple, taking care of making sure people were doing right things and not wrong things in their quote-unquote temple. Uh, and they were the official keepers of the religion itself. So that's how entrenched they were. Now, 
you talk, you're not talking about everyday people. That means the city governments were, this is how they were. This is what they were embracing. You see what I'm saying? It's not just the people. This was, this, the, the, Rome charged the city officials with this responsibility. So um, that's a little bit of background about them. I'm not going to go any further. Um, now, as far as the church being established and the Christian church being established in, in Smyrna, well, there is no information on it. There is nothing that, that talks about it. There are some speculations that are out there, um, whether it be Paul or John, but there is no evidence of how the gospel reached there. It could have got there when Paul was on his many journeys. He could have stopped through there and it didn't document it. Or some of them people, since they were all so close, if you remember that map, they were kind of close. Uh, they could have traveled from one city to the other. Heard Paul was there and some people went down there and heard him that way. But there is no real information on how the gospel got to Smyrna. Um, I also want to say it's notable that there's only four verses in the book of Revelation regarding Smyrna. So we just really don't have a whole lot of information outside of what's really in the book of Revelation. Amen. Um, so in the last thing I want to point out, Smyrna did not, you know, unlike Ephesus, if you remember, I told you Ephesus for a time anyway, did make Christianity their official religion of the city. So this is something endorsed by the government. Um, Smyrna didn't do that. They remained uh, supporting these I idol worship and all these false Greek gods and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of, uh, so they did not take hold of the gospel that got there is my point. The gospel came and church, there was a church established obviously because obviously, we got a letter written to that church, but they did not lay hold of it like Ephesus did. The whole city laid hold of the gospel when it went there. Um, that kind of sets up a little bit of trouble, as we'll see later on. Amen. So now that being said, let's go ahead and uh, look at chapter two. And we, I'm, we're just going to read through these these four long verses uh, about this this church. All right. So starting at verse eight, it says, and unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, who's the angel? Yep. Amen. The pastor or the ministers, the uh, fivefold ministry, whoever, that's, who's, that's who that is. Uh, they, uh, he said, right, these, these, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and your tribulations and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things. Yeah, okay, I'm going to keep going. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Verse 11, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so the things that they, that they said good about them was really, there was only two things that, that, that they identified that was good. And that was their works, right? And then it says, uh, and their tribulation. And, and so this is one of the churches that was experiencing heavy tribulation uh, back in that time. They were. Um, <clears throat> and they, the, the history records that the persecution came from two areas. The first thing was all of the, 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 people in the city who worshiped all these other gods, right? So naturally, they're coming in trying to spread this other gospel. It led to trouble. Uh, but then additionally, additionally, hi, Mom. Okay, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, they also got, remember, did you see here, they, they got persecution from the Jews. Did you see here it said, uh, it says, uh, I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Remember when Jesus was talking to the Jews, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and well, long story short, they, they called him of the devil. And he turned around and said, no, I follow my father. You are of your father of the devil and his works you will do. So that's what that's talking about. They were Jews. 
by blood, but they were not God's children uh, just because they were of the Jewish blood. And he told them to their face, you are of your father, the devil. So I think that's what that's referencing. Amen. So they got persecution from the Greeks and whoever else was living in that city that worshipped all these other goofy gods. And they got persecution from the Jewish uh, people that were there. So they had it coming on every side. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, uh, but you see, the fact that he didn't complain about them, to me, infers that they must have held on to their faith. There was no complaints about them. They didn't succumb to the pressures or the persecutions. They remained faithful. So in, in, in mentioning that they went through these tribulations, it's a, it's a commendation. Hey, job well done. Amen. Um, so I think that's something notable because they were catching it on every side, every side. And yet they still stay faithful. That's uh, a really good thing. Uh, and then, of course, um, he encouraged them not to be afraid because more persecution was going to be coming. We're going to get to it. I'm not going to say it now, but we read that and we say how that's terrible, and it is. But, you know, that kind of goes on today. We're sometimes blinded to it because we live in America. We'll talk about that later. Amen? Um, matter of fact, so I'll go and let's do this. So... <clears throat> To me, you contrast, uh, contrast Ephesus and their experience. The church didn't have heavy persecution over there uh, for a while anyway because the city made it their, Christianity the official religion. So that church was over there, and it was able to grow and prosper. They had great works and all the stuff they did. God didn't have a whole lot of complaints other than one little minor thing. So it kind of stands to reason that they kind of did well. Um, on the other hand, you got Smyrna, who's in the heart of all this pagan worship of all these false gods. And on top of that, you got the Jewish church in there persecuting them. Uh, they had to still manage to survive and put that in today's time. To me, that kind of mirrors some of what we see in life today. America has I'm doing in quotes. That's another conversation, but they have confessed to be a Christian nation uh, since its inception. Um, and, <clears throat> and we, the church, have been able to benefit from being in a country where religion, the practice of our Christian religion, was not only protected, but in reality, even though they had separation of church and state, the reality is, is they wrote laws to protect our ability to grow and prosper and spread they made sure that that was able to happen. We benefited from that, kind of like the church in Ephesus did. But you take the churches that are over in China and North Korea and Syria and all these other places, they're equivalent to what Smyrna dealt with. You see what I'm saying? This, is, this really is, even though it was back then, it's also today. <laughs> Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, well, anyway, you get my point. That's all I'm going to say. They, that parallel between them two places reminds me of what we see going on today. I'm going to just leave it at that. <clears throat> all right. Um, and, oh, so I do want to say this. Kind of a little bit different, but somewhat the same. Talking to Her uh, Howard uh, a week or two ago. He was, at one point in time, in case y'all don't know, him and his wife, they had a church. They were pastors. They started this church and had it going. Um, they, it was down Finkel and Lasher area, did you tell me? Finkel and Lasher area. That's a rough neighborhood. So it's a rough neighborhood. And on top of that, they were taking on a strip club in the area. So they were catching it. They had a hard way to go. Whereas some churches who are in the suburbs kind of got a little easy. Churches in the city of Detroit, they always got to deal with their churches being broken into. 
their cars being broken into in the parking lots, they catch it. Churches in the suburbs don't necessarily have all that kind of pressure. So it's even kind of similar in that way. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, um, uh, so uh, now the thing is said where it said about poverty, it also said their poverty, it said, but you are rich. And that has always stood out to me. And I have often wondered what that means. I can't tell you that God has just spoken to me clearly and said this is what it means. But there are three things that I see are options for this situation. The first one is uh, when he said, I know your poverty, because he's writing this letter to that church. I know your poverty, because the word poverty does mean monetarily poor. Um, it wasn't talking about spiritual poverty at all, because they obviously were not spiritually impoverished. Um, but thou art rich. So why would he say that? Well, either A, he was saying, yeah, I'm writing this letter and I'm acknowledging your poverty, but I also know that you know that you're rich. He's talking about rich in the spirit. He obviously ain't talking about rich in the natural realm. But in the spiritual realm, they are rich. In their spirits, they were rich. Amen. Amen. They had no complaints, so they were rich. Um, or he was trying to tell them, yes, you are in poverty, but I'm telling you, you're rich. So the letter could be instructing them, making them realize, think about this a little different. Yeah, you got poverty right now, but you're really rich. So it's one of those two things. Um, <clears throat> or the last thing is, because uh, uh, when you, to me, what I read it, what it meant a long time was almost sound like they were poor and didn't realize that they were rich in the spirit. It almost sounded like they were, so he had to let them know, hey, you really are rich. So something in there was going on. Um, and and uh, but either way, it says that they were poor, monetarily poor, but they were rich in spirit. Amen. And I don't know about you guys. I will tell you about me. What's most important is to be rich in spirit. Amen. To me, that is what's most important beyond the struggles of this life. You know. I'm going to say this real quick. <clears throat> We're only spending 80, 90 years on this earth, except Toria trying to be here 120. Uh, we only spend 80, 90 years, most of us, on this earth. And forever we're going to live in the kingdom of God. We're not dying dead when we leave here. You continue to live. Amen. In the spiritual realm. And at some point, we're going to live back here on the earth in natural bodies again but eternal bodies. But that being said, when you compare 80, 90 years to the rest of your life, the rest of your life, what's more important? The rest of your life. It's almost like, you know, when your kids got to go to college, right? And they're like, they just finished 12 years of school, regular school, and they got to go to college. And, you know, they think, man, I got to do this for four more years. And then, you know, and you got to tell them, look, it's only four more years, and it's going to set you up for the rest of your life to have it a little bit easier. So it's the same concept. It really is. We practice that on a daily basis. Yeah, you're going to struggle with it for a while. It's going to be a lot of work. It ain't going to be fun, typically, but it's okay. It's only going to be for four years. So that's something. I, I take that to this, real, this, this, this life today. It's okay. Whatever I deal with here, I'm not standing for anything. But if I got to go through it, it's for a short time compared to the glory that is waiting for us forever. Way more important. Amen. So uh, that being said, that's it. Um, <clears throat> like I told you, they had no faults. Um, I do want to address this one other thing uh, because I have heard it said. So I am not from anybody in here, but I have heard it said that people who go through persecutions got to be because it's a faith problem. But see, how many of you know if there was a faith problem with them, he would, I believe he would have addressed it. You know how many times Jesus said things like, oh, ye of little faith, or why can't you believe? He said things like that to people when he was on the earth. So obviously, if faith is a problem, 
he himself will point it out. And since he told them to write these letters, I believe he would have pointed it out. Uh, so I don't believe faith was an issue either. Uh, I think they just had something they had to go through. And to me, you can't find any greater faith than somebody who is facing persecution, imprisonment, in some cases even death, and you still refuse to deny the name of Jesus. To me, that is the epitome of faith because that's the ultimate test. Do you really believe in Jesus Christ? Or when it, when the, when the, when, when it comes down to it, are you going to deny him if your life is threatened? It's going to really tell you whether you really believe. Amen? So faith was not a, a problem, I don't believe. Amen? All right, so, um, so now let's go on to the next church. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to go down to Thyatira. Um, okay, I'm only going to give you a little bit of background here for time's sake. Um, well, it's going to be brief, so I'm going to breeze through it. Um, Thyatira... We are skipping over, you notice we skipped over Perg uh, Pergamus, right? All right, in the handouts. Um, <clears throat> they were steeped in witchcraft. Is was the big deal with them. Um, so that's the, one of the main things, and I'm, I'm going to show you, as a matter of fact, I'll give you the detail now. You remember the story when Paul was preaching, out preaching, and this lady was following him behind him, saying, you know, these men are preachers of the Most High God, and eventually he had to cast that evil spirit out that woman. Uh, and it says that she was a sorcerer, and through her sorcery, when, when, once he cast the devil out, she lost her, her witchcraft ability, right? And the people in the area were mad because they made all kind of money off of that talent she had. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, that's how steep they when they when 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 they realized that that spirit was gone and her talent was gone. You remember they turned around and put them in jail. Why are you messing with our money, man? Don't come over here messing with our money. And they put them in jail. That's how steep they were in this religion. Uh, excuse me, in sorcery and witchcraft. They were really steep, heavy into that. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, they were the common skills over there, you know, other places. Everybody has their different makeup, like the, the Detroit area has the big three, you know. So there's, you got Silicon Valley and other areas. So they had their makeup. Their makeup was typically bakers and potters and tanners, which are people who uh, skin animals and get the fur and stuff and sell it. Um, and, and road makers and stuff like that. Those were, that were, those were the main things for their economic engine in that area. Uh, however, the thing they were most notable for was, if you remember the story about Lydia in the Bible, she made, she made garments too and dyed them purple, and that was a big old thing back then. So they were most famously known for selling purple dyed garments. Um, that's a little bit about the city. Um, the main thing is they were entrenched in witchcraft and sorcery. Um, the, now, go to Acts chapter 16. We do have some, some information about how the gospel spread there. So Acts chapter 16. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. So... If you guys want to follow along, I will just read it. Okay, so I'm going to start at verse 13. On the Sabbath day, uh, they went out of the city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And they sat down and spoke to women who resorted near there, who were down there. Uh, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, uh, whose heart the Lord had opened, that she, uh, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. So in other words, God opened her heart. She was listening to the gospel. Uh, verse 15, it says, And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and, uh, and abide here. And she constrained them. Verse 16, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel. Well, I'm not going to read through all that. So... So this is how the gospel started there, through this lady Lydia. 
all right, and her household got saved. Um, and then there was that example of, like I told you, of of uh, the, woman, the 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 evil spirit being cast out the woman. So because the Bible says it, it says that that kind of spread abroad, the news of that spread abroad. So the gospel was even being preached that way. So that's kind of where it got started at. Um, and then let's go down here. So let's look at, uh, I'm going to start at 22. It says, and the multitude rose up together against them, them being Paul and Silas. And the magistrate, magistrates tore their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into a prison, charging the jailer uh, to keep them safe. So they put them in prison, like I said earlier. Uh, and in verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and the foundation of the prison shook, and immediately the doors were open. So there was a shaking, and everybody was free from the prison. And if you recall, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll keep going. 27, it says, and the keeper of the prison, waking up out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew a sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners were gone. Paul said, don't do it. Stop. Do yourself no harm. We're all here. And he called for a light and came in, trembling. Uh, verse 29, it says, and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And if you keep going through there, he got saved and his whole household, whole household got saved. Now, one of the things that you find interesting about the story with the gospel being preached there, if you notice, he went to individual people. Typically, when Paul went into cities, does anybody recall typically what he did when he first got there? He went to the synagogues, exactly. Paul, Paul's custom was to go to the synagogues, but he didn't do that in Thyatira. Apparently, and I'm saying apparently, history records, that there was not a strong presence of Jews in the area. And what's reported, what the Jews would tell you is, you can, you can look in their documents and see, you gotta have a certain number of Jews present before you can go ahead and build a temple. And so apparently there were not enough Jews there for them to even build a Jewish temple. It's, it's what I've been reading mostly about them. So he didn't have a synagogue to go to, right? Uh, so he went to people's home. He ran, talked to people on the street, basically. As he walked throughout the city, as they walked throughout the city, he shared the gospel that way, and people's homes got uh, saved behind what he did. So that was kind of how the gospel spread there, which I find is a little different than most churches. Amen? Um, <clears throat> so... Um, Yeah, I don't need to point that out anymore. Okay, I do want to point this out. So, again, like Ephesus, they made Christianity the, the official religion of the city. But Thyatira didn't, didn't do that either. And so, uh, if you read the story about the woman who the devil was cast out of and everything, they bought him before the city officials. They bought them before the city officials. The city officials decided to beat him and put him in prison. So I'm saying that to say because the city officials didn't make Christianity their official religion, that's really what uh, paved the way for persecution to happen uh, to them. You see what I'm saying? That makes sense? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so now let's look at some of the, go back to Revelation chapter 2. Okay, so I wish we were kind of in the basement. I'm, I'm glad we're live streaming, but you know I miss being able to let other people read. Uh, add a little bit to the, to the service. But okay, we'll look at verse, uh, starting at verse 18, Revelation 2, 18. I do miss that. Um, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet as fine brass. I know your works, right? First thing he points out, good. And charity, love, your love. So he's, he's commending them for their love. Um, and your service and your faith. 
So he's even commending them for their faith. Amen. Uh, and your patience. And he says, and your works again. And he says, and the last works are more than the first. Basically, he's saying your works now that you're doing are even greater, either of better quality or more in quantity than the works you did in the beginning. So he's really commending them uh, on a lot of stuff. Amen. So they were doing well in the midst of this city with all this witchcraft and stuff going on. Um, now, they did have, well, here, let me do this. Um, okay. Let's, one more good thing. I want to go ahead and point this out while we're here. Go down to verse 24. Because there is one other good thing before we get to the bad. Uh, no, maybe I shouldn't do that. Okay, we can't do that. So, all right, I'm sorry. Let's go back up. So now we're going to start talking about the bad. Uh, um, verse 20, excuse me. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. Because you suffer that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit, in this case, fornication, adultery, sexual acts, uh, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Um, I gave her space to repent of her fornications, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent from their deeds. So, this is a woman. Uh, I don't know if it was actually a woman or not, but he, he likens her to Jezebel. And What's happening is, is she's calling herself a prophetess. So this is talking about somebody in their church or somebody that they're allowing, a guest they're allowing to come into their church. And it says that she's teaching them, calls herself a prophetess, speaking on God's behalf, and she's teaching them things basically that are pulling them away from God. That's what the complaint is. Um, Teaching and seducing my servants to do something that is ungodly is basically what it's saying, right? Um, so anyway, that was the problem. Their only problem, their only complaint was that they let somebody get in their pulpit and preach something that was leading the people astray. This was their downfall. Uh, no other complaints. That was it. You're letting people speak in your pulpit that are, and they're teaching doctrine that's false, doctrine that's wrong, doctrine that's hurting the people. And, you know, for those of you who've been here for a long time and the rest of you will see as you're here, um, we are very careful about who we let get up in this pulpit and teach and, and preach. We don't just go around inviting everybody. And I know, won't call it, I know a particular church because I know somebody that goes there Every time you turn around, they got some guest speaker coming in, guest speaker coming in, guest speaker coming in. I'm not saying anything about them because I don't know. But I'm telling you, we don't just give this thing out to anybody. Because of that, we feel the responsibility, Pastor Noel especially, and Pastor Taylor, feel the responsibility of your souls. Amen. And so we're not going to just let any old body get up in here. I'm going to tell a story. No, you remember this. I don't know if anybody else it, it was here at the time. But this was when we were still at the Bridge Club having our meetings there. And they invited somebody to speak that was from their former church, which I won't even call that name. So they invited somebody to speak from that former church. And this lady, and she came and she spoke. And when I tell you that everybody's eyes was like this, as she was talking, like, what are you saying? What? I'm serious. And you could see, you, I looked over at Pastor, at, uh, Pastor Taylor, and you could just see dread in his face because his eyes was open just as wide. <laughs> like, and you could tell he still like, what in the world did I just do? Oh, my God. That lady never came back. She was never invited back. And, uh, yeah, she was, Mom, you, I don't know if you were there either. Anyway, the, the, the stuff she was saying was just, whew, I'm not going to say what she was saying. She was, she was a trip. So I'm saying, uh, 
He tried that once, and yeah, that backfired, and he was really careful after that, that much more careful. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it was, it was an interesting little story. <clears throat> uh, it was, you had to be there to experience. Christine was there. She'll tell you about it. Was anybody else here there? Huh? Was anybody else in here? Were y'all there that day? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I don't think so. No. All right. Anyway, ask Christine about it or ask Noel. Uh, so anyway, uh, that was their problem. Like I said, was they let somebody into their pulpit and this person was leading the people astray. And that'll tear up a church. Amen. That will wreck people's lives. Wreck people's lives. And this was the problem that he had with them. Amen. Um, so now I will go ahead. Now behind that. Let's look at. Uh, and of course, he gave them space to repent. He told them, I need y'all to quit that. Now, verse 24, now we go to 24, he says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. So there were some people in the congregation who did not succumb to that, who did not endorse that, did not support it. Um, as many as I have... Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none other burden upon you, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. So I say that to, there's two things to me that stand out about that. One, even in the midst of turmoil, you're subject to find some real true believers in any church. There, so we can't just assume because somebody goes to a church that we might question that they ain't really saved because there can be some true believers still there who are unspotted, who do not, you know, go after these false doctrines and false teachings. Uh, and, and, and so God, and, and, and the other nice thing is, is God addressed them separately. Even though the punishment potentially was coming on the church, the people who were still, who were still true, they were covered. They were good to go. Nothing was going to happen to them. So I'm glad that God sees he ain't just throwing the whole body all in, in the garbage can. You know what I'm saying? That's a good thing. That's how our God is. Amen. So that's the other thing that, that stood out about that to me. Um, so now I want to take this last little bit of time. I should have got that ball going. Uh, I'll have to repeat the questions for you. So now that we've talked about these, uh, let me, let, let's recap this. So the first church was persecuted heavily. Uh, they had good works, but they were persecuted heavily, uh, and they still withstood regardless of the pers persecution. So they still held on to their faith. The second church, or yeah, on Thyatira, uh, they were steeped in witchcraft and sorcery in the city, uh, not to mention the persecution of Paul and Silas, uh, and but and their only error was that they let people teach in their, their, their sanctuaries and their pulpits that shouldn't be teaching. So you got two examples. One church is living in the midst of turmoil and persecution and chaos, and they still holding on to their faith. And then you got the other one who is in an area where they're doing good, but they letting bad people speak in their pulpits. So let's talk about that for a minute. Can we think of if those who have an ear to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I'm not even going to, we don't fit in either one of those, if you ask me. Um, so I'm not even going to ask us about us. But let's think about churches, situations that we know are going on in the world. Or situations where there's false doctrines you know that crept into churches. Uh, and have caused some damage. Uh, Let's, so let's go with some, some false doctrines that you guys have heard that you know have crept into churches. Let's do it that way. Say it out loud. Get one person at a time. Think of some false doctrine that you know have crept into churches uh, throughout your lifetime that you have heard. Okay, I'm going to start it. Uh, I done said it before, so I'm going to use this basic one. Uh, the prosperity gospel. First, I'm going to start by saying, no, I certainly believe God wants us to be prosperous. Okay, that's scripture. But 
that prosperity gospel at one point got way out of hand. And like I told some of you before, I said it before, it's almost like they were presenting God as a sugar daddy. You know what I'm saying? Like you come to God, he's going to give you a new house, a new car. You're going to get everything, a great job. You're going to become a millionaire. Everybody's going to be rich and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it just went too extreme is my point. To the point where, I, you know, I, don't, I didn't say this last time. To the point where some of those people that were wrapped up into that teaching, that prosperity gospel, uh, these were people, honestly, that kind of followed Kenneth Hagin. And the problem was is they were out of balance and he wasn't. I don't know, do y'all know that those people who, out of, who were way extreme, Kenneth Hagin actually called a meeting with all them guys and got them together and told them, y'all off. Y'all out of balance. Y'all need to get this together. Um, all of them came except for one person. One person refused to come. Um, so anyway, I say that, say, it, they got off. They got extreme. So that's one. Give me some other doctrines that y'all know of. They crept into churches throughout the, the country, at least. MJ? She said, raising nationalism above Jesus Christ. In other words, all this political party has been infused into the religion and to some churches. And they have made it. Who are going to want to go to church service after service and all you're hearing about is, is political politics? <laughs> what? But they have. And they, oh, uh, uh, yeah, it's been extreme. I agree. And there are churches who, uh, they basically put, America before God and the Republican Party before God. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anybody else? So they'll get this. There are people, those people that are in them churches have been all wrapped up into it. Not everybody, but they have been all wrapped up into it. They paying money, they giving their offerings and their tithes, and, and they going around holding up signs. People buy into that stuff. Okay, and this is stuff that's in the pulpit. And I, I, I'm going to take one, one step a little further. I said this before. The way they presented it with Donald Trump was almost like God can't get his plan done without Donald Trump. That was kind of weird. Like, what? So anyway, I agree. What else we got? Some other doctrines that crept in. Yes, sir. D. Lance. Yes. Yeah, the, the uh, LBGTQ doctrine. Yes. And has crept into some churches to the point where, as y'all know, we've talked a lot of you, you've heard us. There are churches, whole denominations that not only accept it as a lifestyle and tell them people they can be members of their church, but they can actually become ordained ministers and bishops and whatnot. That's contrary to what the word of God says. But now it then took a foothold in that church and has, has become a mainstay in some of them churches, them denominations. And, and don't get me wrong. Homosexuality is just as sinful as adultery or fornication. You ain't married, right? Um, it's just becoming so pre prevalent now that it's affecting the churches. That's insane. I agree. Thank you, sir. Any, any others? Any other doctrines? So legalism. Yeah, uh, yeah, legalism is a real thing where basically they're not recognizing that our salvation is a free gift and we are made righteous by the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made. Amen. So, and, and, that's something that has really been entrenched, and that's something that has happened throughout time to where when, when, if you leave in church every Sunday, every Sunday, and you're feeling guilty, like you're coming up short every time you go to church, I would question that because there's a good probability that the person that's preaching it probably got his own baggage or her own baggage. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh... Yeah, that's, it's just off, is the point. It's off. Okay, anybody got any, any more? 
Okay, how about uh, race baiting? Uh, so let me explain this. Race baiting. Uh, I don't want to call. Pastor Noah and told me to be careful about calling certain things out. So I'm being careful here. So I won't call them out. But there are people with the name Reverend in front of their names who confess to be ministers of the gospel, but most of what they preach is all about racial issues, black and white problems. I'm talking, I, I have listened to sermons from two of them that I'm thinking of in my mind. And this is what they sermon, the whole sermon is about stuff like that. No God in the middle of it. They just talking about the offenses done by some white people in the country. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'll put it to you this way. I can say with at least a 99.9% .9 confidence, Pastor Noel nor Pastor Cox is going to let that creep up in here where everything is a black-white problem. Of course, we'll address that there are issues. That'll be talked about. But, yeah, there are some people who got reverend behind their name, and really, that's their whole pulpit. Their pulpit is built around that, not the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are some examples. Now, I, I, we're going to see this later on, so I'm just going to, for right now, I said this before, if you want to count this as Davidology, feel free. Because I can't prove it now, I don't have time. But the churches that preach that, along with that prosperity gospel, was basically that we church folk, we ain't supposed to be going through nothing. Now, you done heard no talk about it this year. Toya done talked about it this year. You know, I've talked about uh, tribulation times in the past myself. Being a Christian, you're not going to be, uh, life ain't going to be just grandiose. There are going to be some struggles and hard times that we face. Amen? There will be. And as far as the tribulation goes, I certainly believe that the Bible is clear that we, you know, if it happens in our lifetime, I'll put it this way, the church will be here to go through the great tribulation. Now, I'm saying that to say, what about the whole pre-tribulation rapture uh, doctrine? There are people who preach it wholeheartedly as, it, as it's a matter of fact. I, and I mean, it's one thing to say this is what I believe, but when you hear them people saying, I don't know what's wrong with you. Why would you want to be here? I don't hurt it. Why would you want to be here to go through that? Guess what? You want to stay here and go through it? You go ahead. I'm not going to be here. And they're teaching their people that. They present it as though we're not supposed to go anything, go through anything is my point. That doctrine has presented itself in the church, in some churches, a lot of churches, that we ain't supposed to go through nothing. That's a false doctrine. So here you go. If we are going to be here, Let's just say we are going to be here. Let's say what I believe I see is right. We going the church is going to be here, but you got all these people out here saying, "No, we're not going to be here. We're not going to be here." How many people got their guard down saying, "Well, I ain't got to worry about taking the mark of the beast because we ain't going to be here anyway. I don't have to worry about watching because we well, I'm gonna be gone." You see what I'm saying? You're subject to get sucked up into it because you're not prepared. Jesus said he told him the thing them the things that that he told them to have them prepared, to get them ready. They asked what's going to happen, and he told them what was going to happen so they would be able to be prepared and be able to get ready. And now you got people coming behind saying, no, it's not going to happen. I believe that crept into the church. So anyway, small example. We'll, we'll probably talk a little bit about that at some future date. Uh, if you want to ask me any questions after, feel free. Um, but I think that's it. It's 801. I stole 60 seconds. Don't call the police on me. Uh, so thank you for your time. If you have any questions right now, I'm willing to take them.